welcome to the con ask and we are here with billy himself yeah don't be a hero well yes be a hero and endear yourself to millions all around the world zach galligan how you doing i'm doing great how are you i'm very very well now gremlins yes one and two yes back for both yep um and two very different type of films in genre Definitely. um do you have a personal favorite did you prefer the more horror elements of the first one or did you like the out and out just bizarre joe dante letting his hair down being allowed to do whatever the hell he wanted i prefer the first one uh i love the mixture of the horror and the comedy i think that's a very difficult thing to do i thought it, joe managed to kind of masterfully balance that in the first one the second one is a deeply subversive <laughs> and unusual sequel uh, i don't actually don't can't think of another sequel that's really like it in that its sole purpose is to destroy the reputation of the first one. Um, so that's a kind of subversive thing that Joe did. Um, it's very funny. I appreciate it more and more every time I see it. It wasn't as much fun personally for me to film because the scheduling was very strange for me. Uh, when I did the first Gremlins, I basically just worked almost constantly, probably 75 out of like 80 days. Wow. So I was busy, and I if I'm going to do a movie, I like that. And Gremlins 2, I did like the first 30 days, and then I had like 35 days off, and then I did like the last 30 days. So it was about 90, 95 days, and the middle was so, it was such a huge break in the middle. I went off, I went back to New York, I got sunburned, I peeled, I got pale again, I came <laughs> back. I mean, it was a long break, yeah, yeah, and then you come back and you have to get your head back in the space again. It was a very strange, it's a very, very strange thing. Um, maybe people who do TV series, I've never actually done like a long TV series like Game of Thrones or Breaking Bad. Maybe they're used to taking those big breaks and then coming back and getting back into it. But that was the first time I'd ever had like the part interrupted like that. Yeah. So it was strange. Um, and uh, how was it working with that amount of puppetry and animatronics? And how was that for you as an actor working with, you know, puppeteers and all that type of stuff. Well, on the first, you'd have to talk about both movies because with Chris Wayless in the first one, Rick Baker in the second, two wildly different ways of approaching it, two really inventive, amazing guys. Chris Wayless was only about 28 or 29 when he did all of the effects on Gremlins, and he was essentially making it up as he was going along. Was it just him? Did he have a team or just... Well, when they hired him, it was just him. <laughs> and he told the story. We did this thing for Empire Magazine where we got like six of us in a room from the movie. Uh, Rick Baker and Chris and Joe Dante, Dick Miller, myself. And everybody told their side of the story. It was like Rashomon. And everybody had like different experiences yeah, on yeah, Gremlins. Yeah. <clears throat> so I didn't know this until a few months ago. But when they hired Chris Wayless, he did it on a handshake deal. And it, he said, I will do all of the effects for Gremlins, everything signed on the dotted line. And when he literally like closed the door and said, great, I can't wait to get started, he had no team, no people, no puppeteers, nothing, worked, no shop, no place to build it. <laughs> so like he signed the deal and then he had to go get everything. How, long, how much time did he have to... I think he, had a, I think he had a good year to figure it out, but... It's such a massive undertaking. Yeah. A year is actually not that much time. That's no time at all to get an entire company up. To get an entire company up and running. So so he had all sorts of challenges with that. And, and, and I mean, I could talk forever about it, but, uh, you know, the cables and the wires going up and down my body and attached to me. If you notice, one of the good things about it taking place in the winter is that I'm always wearing long sleeve shirts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the I can hold the gizmo and the cables can go down my arms. So they're hidden. Because there was no way to hide the cables unless they would go down into my clothes. And, and was, did they malfunction quite a lot? Was it a slow process? Yeah, well, in the beginning, the first month or, yeah, first month, you know, the dog would step on it. And then <laughs> the scene with the box where I get it for Christmas, the dog stepped on the ear and tore it off. And Wayless would come over and he'd be like, oh, yeah, oh, dear, oh, wow. And it was funny because I always said to him, I said, you know, Chris, one of the things about you was... I always felt that, that even though you were on top of things, I felt like you were always sort of close to having a nervous breakdown on the movie. And you know what he said to me? What did he say? He said, I did. I said, what are you talking about? He said, I had, and he'll talk about this in interviews, so I'm not telling tales out of school. Towards the end of the movie, he had a nervous breakdown. 
he was also on the back of a truck and they were taking him somewhere. He fell off the back of the truck and he like broke his ankle or something like that. And that was like the straw that made him go like, I can't take it anymore. <laughs> and so he's freaking out. Then in number two, and I worked with Rick Baker, it's the complete opposite because Rick Baker, you could argue is the greatest makeup special effects man of, of all time. I'd say he was, yeah, definitely. I mean, 10 nominations, seven wins. Yeah. That's ridiculous. That, that's 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 when evidence. When you're batting 70%, I mean, that's just, that's crazy. Yeah. Um, so the stuff that he had, and I don't know if you ever met Rick, but he's like the calmest, most controlled, everything's going to be flawless thing. And then, of course, it is. Yeah. And he's just, his uh, preparation is so immense. So you went from somebody who was like creating brilliant technology on the fly to someone who was creating brilliant technology but had 150 people working for him. Yeah, that's, that's a whole different type and of... And had been doing it and, and had been working for him for eight years. Yeah. So it was, it just was smoother and, and, and um, but some of the stuff that he was trying to do, like the brain gremlin, yeah. I mean, when they first showed us the Brain Gremlin, that's one of the craziest things I've ever seen because you got to remember it's '89. Yeah. There's no internet. There's, people don't have personal computers. You don't barely do. You don't even have answering machines. Yeah. And so what he did was they got Tony Randall to do all of his speech first. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So he went in and he did it, and then they fed the audio into a babe like infant computer like baby brand new computer <laughs> and the computer would break down the syllables into i don't know what numeric strings or maybe binary code or something like that and each code would trigger one of like 50 facial muscles in the brain gremlin so what he would it, it, they would just feed the sound things it would be decode decoded and it would make the gremlin's face move in accordance with the consonants and the syllables and so i mean now maybe you'd say that's pretty cool 2014 yeah, yeah. but in 1989 we were like this is the craziest yeah. thing i've ever seen in my life and with computers it was like it's the coming of the <laughs> you know it was it was it was insane yeah the hell with cgi man that's all i love that hands-on real effects. stuff i mean it cost a fortune of course now, uh, last question. Now, Gremlins move, has moved into mainstream. It is like part of pop culture history. So, yeah. how has what type of responses do you get from people you meet at conventions? It's not this little cult thing. It is a, it's a, a it's been a part of our lexicon and a part of our world for the last, you know, over 25, nearly 30 years. Yeah. So, how is it meeting the fans? What type of responses do you get? Well, I mean, you know, Comic Con, horror convention fans. They're some of the nicest people in the world. And they're de deeply respectful of what actors and directors and filmmakers do. They really kind of get it. So the response that I get is, I mean, it's all over the place. You get people who are trembling because they're like, I've seen you 500 times and now you're in front of me. And that's, I'm, I'm like, yeah, I can actually talk back to you. Because it's, it's kind of a one-way, yeah, I'm not on this, it's not a one-way experience. I can, you can say something, I can say something back. So some of them are freaked out, some, and some of them are just, some of them are blasé, and some of them are like uh, meeting an old friend. That's pretty so, cool. It's very cool. It's, it's, the thing that I get from conventions more than anything else is that I n never got the first 20 years after the movie is how much entertainment and the stuff that we, we we do how much it really makes an impact on people's lives in a really profound way yeah. so that it's like it's their childhood it's like I, i'm i'm actually sort of a piece of somebody's childhood it's a strange experience like i'm 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 to these people but like maybe margaret hamilton would have been to me or to, you know uh you know uh, someone from the wizard of oz yeah, would exactly. have been would have been to me yeah yeah, yeah. if i if i'd met judy garland it would have been like what <laughs> you know you meet ray bulger you'd be like what you're the scarecrow it's, it's crazy and now you're this for other people it's it's pretty mind-blowing well it's been an absolute pleasure meeting you zach enjoy the rest of your time here and thank you for being on the con thank you